All set. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Wonderful. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tony. My name is Jay Abdallah, and I'm the Global Director of Cybersecurity Services at Schneider Electric. As Tony mentioned, I've been with Schneider for the past seven and a half years, and I was really brought on to solve what I thought was a relatively simple problem. I think one of the advantages that I had by joining Schneider Electric at an early stage in my industrial career, right, because typically cybersecurity experts will start in enterprise security. They'll work through their way in enterprise security until they find a specific specialty, whether that be penetration testing, industrial security, et cetera. So upon joining Schneider Electric, I really didn't know what a DCS or a SCADA system or a PLC was, other than what I had heard and what some of my friends were working on. So the reality was I didn't have the industrial handcuffs that held me from being able to design and implement enterprise class cybersecurity solutions within an industrial control mechanism. So that actually gave me a small advantage because I was sat in front of a DCS. It had a couple of industrial elements in addition to that, like an ESD. And my boss basically said, can you lock this down? Can you secure it? Can you tighten it using what you've learned at Symantec? I said, sure. I don't see why not. After we completed this project, we learned something. So we started tailoring our security program based on what we learned and subsequently turned it into a relatively large business. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But today, we're going to, the agenda for today is going to be we're going to start with the landscape. So we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in the world of industrial cybersecurity. Of course, we will mention the enterprise world because we can't really focus on the industrial elements here unless we also talk about the situation with respect to enterprise class networks. We'll talk about what we believe is the primary threat vector. So where should we focus our efforts? When we completed that first project and wrote our business plan and provided it to our executive committee, we were basically asking for a lot of resources. We were asking for people, we were asking for technology, we were asking for time, time away from billable projects. And in order for them to invest in that, they needed to see the value. So they wanted to know, where will we focus our efforts? That's what this section is about. We'll briefly talk about what Schneider Electric has been doing for the past seven and a half years in terms of building their cyber infrastructure and capabilities. And then I'll ask some frequently asked questions. So we've been giving these presentations or different variations of them globally. And a lot of really great questions, as Tony mentioned, come from the audience. So I'll, I'll pass some of those back to you. And then if we've got time, I'll share with you a story. So this is not something you're going to find on Google. It's a real story. It happened to me and my wife. The situation that I've captured here is just the first time that it happened a couple of years ago. And since then, it's happened on just about every single trip, international trip, that I've taken. Now, for those of you that, uh, that I've had the pleasure of working with for the past couple of years, I'm pretty much on an airplane every other week. So you can imagine this is starting to get a little old, and that's probably why I'm a little bit more comfortable talking about it. So I'll, uh, I'll share that experience with you at the end of the presentation. So let's start off by talking about the current threat landscape. What is happening in the world? Well, the reality is, here's, here's the, the snapshot. Over on the top left-hand corner, what we can see is that the industrial cybersecurity market has grown quite substantially just in the past few years. So using a combination of software, hardware, and services, we're clearly seeing that in 2018, we're exceeding five billion US dollars spent globally. Now this is not enterprise class security. Matter of fact, that market can't even fit on the chart. You're talking about hundreds of billions spent. I'm talking more specifically about industrial control security. So these are systems that are designed specifically to protect critical manufacturing, critical infrastructure, energy, food and beverage, water and wastewater, anything that really relates to that industrial or mechanical element. So over here on the, on the top left hand side you can see that the compound annual growth has grown quite substantially and we have to ask ourselves why. Why the investment? What's happening? What's changing? Over on the bottom left hand side as you can see from our friends over at AV Test, they have shown that there are over 350,000 new pieces of malware written every single day. Now when we take a step back and consider that, 
That's a massive challenge ahead of us. Now, I'm not saying that these are all targeting our customers, and I'm certainly not saying that they're targeting industrial specific applications. But what I am saying, that this is the landscape. And if this is the landscape, and if we take a fraction of that as aimed towards the types of networks that we typically work within and support, then we've got a challenge ahead of us. And as vendors of critical infrastructure and control systems, we have that obligation. We have that obligation to you to provide you not only with secure products, but security services that will provide you with operational life cycle security. We're not trying to set it and forget it, like that old chicken rotisserie commercial. We want to make sure that we look at this from an operational life cycle perspective. Over here on the right hand side, we can see some examples of what happened. Now, I usually only use examples that have taken place in the past couple of years. There will be one that I'll reference that kind of kicked all of this off, which happened about 10 years ago. However, if we take a look over here, anybody use Uber? I know it's not very popular in certain parts of the UK, but for the you know, uh, hundreds of millions of people that do use it, there was a massive attack that happened uh, last year. Actually, we, were, we found out about it last year. So my challenge is not necessarily just putting up the different types of situations that we've seen, the breaches that we work on. My challenge is what happened after the fact. Now we know that for the most part, vulnerabilities exist, and with those vulnerabilities will come exploitations. And with those exploitation will come a breach, a breach of some kind. Matter of fact, a recent statistic that I saw last year indicated that 20% of businesses here in the United Kingdom have had some kind of material breach. But if we take into, this, the, into this, these particular situations, Equifax and Uber, what we see that really intrigues me is the corporate response. And in this case, it was dismal at best. As a matter of fact, in the Uber situation, over one year passed by the time the situation was made public. So during that year, whomever broke into this network had access to all of our credit cards. Same exact situation with Equifax. Now for those not familiar, Equifax is one of three organizations in the United States that manages our credit. So similar to what we have here in the UK, we also have a credit system, but we don't have a choice who we sign up with. There are three companies, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. Equifax holds the vast majority of the credit card numbers, your mother's social, your mother's social number, your mother's maiden name, uh, all of your addresses, phone numbers, contact information, etc. Basically, the most critical elements of your financial security. They experienced a breach. And what was the immediate response? Nothing. They waited at minimum three months before they made this public. You're talking about approximately 150 million people. I was one of them that were impacted. So what did they do? They sent out a note and they said, we're sorry this happened. And here's one year of free cybersecurity online protection for your credit. Basically gives you a mechanism to lock your credit. What they fail to realize is that these situations, we were talking last night in the restaurant, we were talking about what happens after somebody steals our credit card information. And the reality is, if, you're, you know, if it's a small time hacker or if it's just a, a person trying to, to get a couple of bucks, they're gonna go and start spending money. I remember being with my wife at a dealership just a few weeks ago and you know, somebody started spending money on one of my credit cards and I shut it down immediately. That being said, these larger breaches, they don't get starting to spend immediately. They actually house that data and mine that data, package that data, and then sell it. Today, the attractive element is selling that data. So that year of protection that they gave me was completely useless because they probably wouldn't start using it for at least another 18 to 20. When we look at this a little bit closer, we can see that there is a war going on. Now what you're seeing on screen, we didn't write this, this is from our friends over at Norris, this is called the IP Viking Threat Map. There are different security information and event management SIEM collectors around the world that show attack sources, attack types, destinations, etc. This is a one minute screen grab of those types of situations. What we can see is that they never stop. It happens every minute of every day, always. It doesn't stop for Easter, it doesn't stop for Christmas. These situations are constantly happening, and as a matter of fact, they're constantly evolving. So we always find ourselves behind the eight ball. 
especially when it comes to trying to create systems that will prevent these types of attacks from happening. What are we looking to protect? At Schneider Electric, we, we're proud of the fact that we have industrial IoT capabilities. And we're proud of the fact that we have mobility solutions. We have cloud-based solutions, whether that be your private cloud, our cloud, or Amazon Web Services, or Microsoft Azure. We have the capability using our eco-structure grid at the top layer with analytics and services. All of these applications, services, and products require some element of security. And when we cross-reference that with some historical examples that we've seen just in the past two years, we see that we're really not learning fast enough. Now, we talked about some of these situations just a few moments ago. At least this example was on the screen. But the reason I find this very interesting is the German steel mill and the Ukrainian power grid have a times two after them. This means that they happen twice. And you want to know something? They happen twice in two years, same exact attack vector, same exact source, same exact destination. So we have to ask ourselves, why? Why didn't we learn? The first time that it happened, especially in Ukraine, 20% of homes in the city of northern Kiev were without power. So why are we allowing this situation to take place again? Are we simply thinking possibly, well, we were already hit, we're probably not going to be hit again? That's ignorance. We have to educate ourselves when it comes to protecting our networks and more importantly, that human aspect, learning from situations that have happened and tailoring to move forward. The, the situation in Germany is very interesting to me. The reason I consider this ex extremely interesting is because this is only the second time in recorded history that a cyber attack caused physical damage. Physical, something actually broke. And whenever you have major physical damage, you have obviously the potential for human loss. The biggest tragedies that we can think of, especially when we take into consideration the scale with cyber operations. So I showed you a three-dimensional map a short while ago about the enterprise attacks. But this one concerns me a bit more. Now, I had the opportunity to meet the founder of Shodan in Kuwait a few months ago. And what you're seeing on screen now are not enterprise systems that are lobbing attacks at one another. These are control systems. And for those engineers in the room, you can see the protocols over on the left-hand side are industrial protocols. Now, why this map even exists troubles me. The fact that there are control systems, SCADA, emergency, distributed control, programmable logic, all of these systems that you see on screen, for some reason, have direct connectivity to the internet. Which means any sophisticated network infrastructure uh, weakness or control or even when we take a look at some of the scripts that are available out there for purchase, some of them are even free, probably wouldn't be too difficult to break in to network systems like this. So my question is, where did this start? If you remember 10 years ago, about 12 years ago, critical infrastructure, manufacturing, energy, that really wasn't the target. The target was banking, finance, human and health services, even Hollywood. But the reality is in the past 10 years, we've seen a paradigm shift. And that shift is what led into this massive growth of the need for industrial control mechanisms. So we ask ourselves, what was the pivot point? What happened? There was one particular situation that really shed a light on this particular incident from happening. And I'm going to share that with you in just a moment. I actually forgot to plug in the, uh, the audio, so I'm going to do that just now. Why can't we talk more openly and publicly about stocks? Two answers before you even get started. I don't know, and if I did, we wouldn't talk about it anyway. Something as simple and innocuous as this becomes a challenge for all of us to maintain accountability control of our critical infrastructure systems. This actually contains the Stuxnet virus. It's impacting industrial control. Is this something that's coming after the homeland? If you get up in the morning and turn off your alarm and make coffee, 
power plants, power grids, and pump gas, transportation, telecommunication, and use the ATM, you've touched industrial control systems. It's what powers our lives. Most of these systems are relatively easy for a sophisticated hacker to get into. The security experts who are studying Stuxnet really think it required the resources of a nation state. It's spread to any Windows machine in the entire world. We didn't know if it was set to turn off all electricity plants around the world or it would start shutting things down or launching some attack. It was blowing up centrifuges and it was leaving no trace. There have been assassinations of nuclear scientists. Some human assets had to be involved. Spies. It went beyond our worst fears, our worst nightmares. This is not your ordinary criminal doing this. This is someone bigger. The monster turned against its creators, and now everyone is in this game. This has the width of August 1945. Somebody just used a new weapon, and this weapon will not be put back into the box. You've been focusing on Stuxnet, but that was just a small part of a much larger mission. So what you just saw is a trailer for a movie. The movie is called Zero Days, and it highlights the situation that happened back in 2010 with Stuxnet. For those of you that are not familiar, uh, this particular movie highlights a lot of the details, and it shows that although it was never specifically proven, certainly not in court, the people behind this were the United States CIA and the Israeli Mossad. So when we talk about certain types of breaches, there are different security levels. And those, our protection mechanisms, for example, protect against certain levels. The last level is called SL4. So this is the protection against completely so very sophisticated means with unlimited resources and unlimited time. And in that case, it's almost impossible to protect against. That's exactly the situation that they experienced with this Siemens PLC and with, uh, with this particular plant in Iran. So it was very challenging to protect against that type of system because they infiltrated the weak element. And that weak element was really highlighted in the matter of time. So when we look at this from a timing perspective, this is some really important stuff that we can share. First of all, the vast majority, this is from Panda Labs, by the way, they, they, re they send out this report every year, um, as well as some, some other reports from the United States Department of Homeland Security. Really great information with regards to our industry. But from the initial attack to the initial compromise, so from the time that the attack was launched in most cases, up until all of the controls were compromised, what we can see is that a majority of respondents indicated it was only a matter of hours. So all those firewalls and all those host-based protection systems, the vast majority of the cases that we've seen, it only took a matter of hours to breach the networks. If we take it one step further, from this compromise until discovery, so when did the security experts finally find out what was happening? And again, here you can see that the majority are between weeks and in 31% years. Which means malware or whatever type of software was written, ransomware, etc., was dormant in the networks for a matter of years before we even knew what was going on. So there was one of these events actually in the UK a couple of years ago. Somebody came up to me and said, well, if they're dormant for years and they're not stopping our operation, why do we care? And the answer is, not all of the payloads are targeted to stop operation. In most cases, what they're doing is learning. They're taking data, and they're moving it to what we call a command and control system. That command and control system is typically in the cloud. It's very well protected. It's very dynamic. It hops around different IP addresses around the world. And it's simply collecting data. What we see later is that from that discovery to containment, so now we know what's happening, how long does it take us to clean the network? And again, what we're seeing is between 20 and 17% is a matter of weeks or months. So clearly, <clears throat> excuse me, from a timing perspective, we really have to get on our A game. So let's ask the question, what is the primary threat vector? 
This is the hottest question that we get asked. Where should we focus our efforts? It's the same question that our executive committee asked. We're talking at the end of the day about creating a security program. And that security program requires a budget. And that requires resources. And that requires time. And it requires technology. So because of that, we need to know where are we going to focus our efforts. So you look at a big, massive company like Schneider Electric, and we ask ourselves, should we focus on perimeter security? So what is perimeter security? I doubt there's many people in the room that don't have a mobile phone. Some of you are probably connected to the Wi-Fi of this network. So with that being said, if any of your phones are corporate phones, you've just expanded your company's network to include this network. And if you're sitting at a Starbucks, you've done the same thing. So when it comes to the perimeter, the edge control, the outside WAN interfaces of the firewalls, is that where we should focus our efforts? Should that be where our research and development dollars go towards? What about physical security? If you do a Google Maps search for Sheba Airport, S-H-A-Y-B-A-H, you'll see a small, very remote airport in the middle of the empty Saudi quarter. It's a desert area about 400 kilometers away from the closest city. The only way in and out of this airport is by a company private plane. So I've been to Sheba many times, and it's actually very beautiful. There are four gas oil separation plants in this empty quarter. And when you land, you actually land at one of the housing facilities, and they take you by car on a floating road that they basically just laid on top of the sand to one of the other gas oil separation plants. And you know when you've gotten close to one of these plants because there's a guy standing in a camouflaged F-150 pickup truck with a 30-millimeter cannon pointed at your face. And then as you get closer, you see the bollards, you see the fences, you see the razor wire, and of course you see the access control. So although Schneider Electric doesn't provide the development and the creation of these physical control systems, we do audit against them, make sure that they're protected and make sure that they're secure. So is that where we should focus our efforts? What about layer one security? We're here talking about field bus modules, control processors, PLCs. Focusing our efforts on the product security organization, ensuring that only permitted traffic source destination, protocol, and ensuring that the system itself is locked. Is that where we should focus our efforts? What about endpoint security? I see many laptops in the room, and when you walk into a control room or a substation, you'll see the same thing. Windows machines, servers, you'll clearly see that endpoints are alive and active on these network infrastructures. So is that where we should focus our efforts? Providing multi-layered, multi-tiered, security solutions for the endpoint. What about remote access? In many cases, customers come to us and ask us to design remote, secure remote access solutions. This is actually one of the solutions within our portfolio. So we can provide, using hardware encryption, using software encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, with front-end front software interfaces, back-end interfaces, the ability to securely remote into a plant site, especially remote plant sites, and provide the support that our customers need. So should we focus all of our efforts there? And the answer is, we should be focusing on all of these solutions, but the number one solution is the individual. Because in over 90% of the cases that I have personally worked on, there has always been a human element that could have been pointed to as the major vulnerability. Now, has anybody seen this movie, Catch Me If You Can? Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks? Anybody? This is the guy that Leonardo DiCaprio portrayed in that movie. His name is Frank Abagnale Jr. Now, after he went around the world and posed as a pilot and a doctor and a lawyer, he eventually got caught and was arrested by the FBI. After spending a short time in jail, if you've seen the movie, the FBI actually pushed for his release because they really needed his help in trying to find criminals that are doing this type of fraudulent activity. Since that time, he still works for the FBI. It's been 42 years. He actually gave a great speech at Google last year where he indicates that 
for the past 15 years, he has seen every single breach that has come across the FBI's desk. He has worked on them personally. And in that video, he specifically mentions that not 98, not 99, but 100% of the breaches were caused by two things. Either somebody doing something that they shouldn't have done or somebody not doing something that they should have done. So that human vulnerability, that human weakness, is the number one area of concern, which is why it's very important to have a structured security program with policies and procedures. And that educational element becomes absolutely critical. And I'm going to prove that to you in just a second. The most popular password in the United States is password123. And as long as, we're, as, long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on the Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password. And <laughs> this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, oh, 95. Yes. Got it. <laughs> well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like, so what, like, like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's um, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So Maria is your password? Oh, yeah. Now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. So as Jimmy Kimmel and his staff portray, it's quite easy to siphon data from that human element. As a matter of fact, when we send our consulting engineers to perform an offline penetration test or a vulnerability or risk assessment, we don't first start with the network closet. We don't first start with the server rack. We're certainly not looking to try and penetrate the firewalls. It's actually a lot harder than you think. We start by making out a fake badge. We walk around with a clipboard, usually a blank piece of paper on it, and we simply ask questions. And you'd be surprised how much information we can capture just by asking questions. So we always want to make sure that there is that element of education and capability when it comes to designing our security programs. So what we see on screen now is the Schneider Electric cybersecurity offer. So we can clearly see we've been busy. <clears throat> it starts really off with assessments. So by assessments, we mean general security consulting. This can get very specific, where we do risk assessments based on a particular standard. So whether that be your standard, our recommended standard, or even an, a national standard that your country is obliged to follow. We see that in many cases in the United States and in many different countries in the Middle East where they take international standards, they duplicate them for their own efforts, and they force, they make it mandatory for vendors such as ourselves to on those specific standards. The deliverable here is simply a report. Where are you and where do you recommend that you should be? Usually it's, it's followed by a spreadsheet that basically we call quick wins that allows you then to take it to the next step and implement the controls and the, the solutions that we recommend. Designing and implementation typically go hand in hand. This is where after an assessment, and it doesn't necessarily have to, if you're already in the process of designing a new control system, then you would most likely jump right to the design and implementation phase, where we will design a cybersecurity control mechanism with several different layers of defense and subsequently implement it for you. This is obviously the biggest piece of the puzzle. This is what takes the most time, and this is where we implement our technologies at your plant site. After the implementation, we provide monitoring and maintenance services. So this is where typically we call it a customer first contract, where we would provide support services on an annual basis to our control systems. But what we've recently done is tailor this to also include a cyber element. So it includes having a cybersecurity set of tasks, set of deliverables, 
on a quarterly basis and on an annual basis. And in many cases, this actually includes an annual vulnerability assessment. And remember, that VA doesn't necessarily only give you security information. It also gives you the necessary data required for you to take budgetary analysis and pass it over to your leadership team. Because this is what helps us to begin the discussions about designing security programs. And then, of course, we've got a training portfolio where we can take customers, and we do this internally as well, by the way, from generic awareness training. This is the part that we focused on just a few moments ago. From generic awareness training all the way up to, through our partnership agreements, into advanced expert. So we talk a little bit about security objectives, and most of them are obvious. These are the obvious ones up here. Protecting sensitive information, reducing financial loss, legal ramifications, etc. And when we, when we look to design these types of solutions for our customers, we also have to take into consideration that trust and confidence is key. Now, I won't share the name. I'm sure you can do your own research. But arguably the world's largest company and the only trillion dollar organization in the world for two weeks, a few years ago, you could not access their public website. When you sent an email to them, you got a bounce back. This is all about trust and confidence, especially since it's tied and specifically related to the government critical infrastructure. So when we take this into consideration, there's no monetary value that can be cross-referenced with respect to trust and confidence. And then, of course, we've got some mandatory compliance requirements. We talked about these earlier. An example of corporate, in Saudi Arabia, for example, they've developed their own standard called the SAEP 99. It's based almost directly off of ISA 99. And they've done an incredible job by standardizing on a specific set of, st of requirements for any critical infrastructure in the, company, in the country. We can't get out of bed and write a proposal unless it meets their very specific and stringent security requirements. In, in a national case, for example, we see Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, even in the United Kingdom. They've got specific standards and in many cases we're, we're obliged to follow. And then, of course, the industry standards are the ones that we typically follow. Of course, whenever we design these solutions, we're trying to maintain efficiency. I had the pleasure of meeting with some customers yesterday. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to see you again. Where we talked about how can we make this solution more efficient? We don't necessarily want to add something that's going to add complexity, it's going to add cost, and in many cases, we actually lose sight of what we started talking about to begin with. If we want to design, for example, an endpoint protection system, we have to do as much as we can with that endpoint protection system in the most efficient means possible. And that means using some of the technologies that requires us to get outside of our comfort zone as control systems engineers. That means using things like virtualization, standardizing our platforms on virtual solutions, having higher performance hosts that can do a lot more with a lot less. This means servicing multiple solutions on single systems. We also have the ability, for example, to provide perimeter and advanced threat protection for systems that no longer meet your modernization requirements. What this means is if we've got an older system, and in many cases we've got customers that are running network infrastructures that have been around for 20 plus years. So they come to us and say, look, the budget cycle hasn't come around to completely modernize, so don't tell me I need an upgrade because that's not going to fly. How else can you protect our system? And we can do that by using perimeter protection capabilities and, of course, other hardening capabilities as well. We're very proud of the fact that our solution follows a defense in depth mechanism. And not only are we providing this, the technical solutions, but we're wrapping it around starting with policies, procedures, and awareness, taking into prioritized consideration the human element, because that is without a doubt where we should start. And our differentiation in the market is the fact that we can provide a custom solution based on our customers' needs. In many cases, we see control systems and automation vendors coming you know, and, and, and bidding on a, on a solution. They're very fixed to a specific vendor and they're fixed to a specific solution. We don't believe in that. We're not married to any specific security vendor and because of that, we can offer these flexible solutions based on the requirement. And the reason we're able to do that is because we comply. So our cybersecurity network infrastructures do comply with IEC 62443, ISO 27001, ISA 99, and many of the other standards that you see on screen. 
these standards actually helped us to develop the solutions themselves. And of course, they have subsequently helped us pave the way for the partnership programs that we've established. So for those IT folks that are in the room, you might take a look over here and say, well, a lot of these are IT companies. That's absolutely right. We have IT security partnerships, but we don't take the commercial off the shelf semantic endpoint protection solution and implement it at a plant. We customize it and we tailor it for industrial applications. And that's extremely important when, as Tony mentioned earlier, we flip that CIA triad over on its side, taking into consideration that operational uptime is without a doubt the number one concern. Not confidentiality, not integrity. It's making sure that the operation itself stays up. So it's availability. Of course, we've invested in our people. Today, the cybersecurity services team is over 80 people worldwide, and we specialize not only in security expertise, but of course also in control systems as well. And that's another element of our differentiation. We're very proud of how far we've come just in the past seven years. So if we start looking at some frequently asked questions, we're coming towards the end of the presentation. Again, these are some questions that get asked to us. One of the first questions is, where is that line of separation between IT and OT? As a matter of fact, that question was asked in our meeting yesterday. We're asked, where is that line of separation? Where do the responsibilities get isolated? The answer to this question always depends on your policy. If you don't have a policy, then typically that line of demarcation is in the DMZ, inside of the DMZ, where anything north is the responsibility of the IT corporate team. And anything south, especially the solutions that we have helped you to design, are the responsibility of the control or the operational technology group. Everything in the middle can and should be converged, not only to ensure an efficient solution, but also because it can help us to focus on operation. Operational efficiency and compatibility is the number one goal here. So if we can add solutions inside of that DMZ layer that allows both sides to take advantage of what they've already got, it makes perfect sense. The first line of defense, I think we answered this earlier when we said, without a doubt, it's the human aspect. It's education. It's not a very expensive Palo Alto firewall. It's not an intrusion detection system. It's not an encryption mechanism. It's without a doubt education. We actually bought about 150 rubber USB keys. This is uh, many years ago. It was only 512 meg on these USB keys. And we loaded them with a very basic identifier application. It wasn't a malware, it wasn't a virus, but we loaded it with a identifier application. And we spent about a month on a hired penetration test trying to break into a customer's network. They hired us to break into their network. They gave us a three month gap, as to a three month window as to when we could break in. And they gave us a get out of jail free card. It's called a police clearance certificate which basically allows us to go on site, penetrate the network, do whatever we have to do to get in, and then if we get caught and get arrested, we can just uh, skate our way out of jail. Most fun part of the job, without a doubt. But what we found is that this company, and I'll narrow it down, it was an automobile company located in Michigan, but I won't tell you which one. This particular company had very strong security controls. We tried to penetrate the network, we tried to penetrate the outside perimeter, couldn't get in. Intrusion detection was very high, even back then. Endpoint protection was solid. So what did we do? We took these 150 USBs and we simply distributed them on the ground and, in, and you know, underneath the windshield wipers in the parking lot. Within the next 10 days, 65% of them showed up on the corporate network. And that would have been just as easy to rewrite that application into an application that allowed us entry. So we can always clearly see that the first line of defense is education. Because otherwise, we wouldn't have 65% people taking these USBs from the parking lot and eventually moving their way into the plant and plugging it in, or into the, the network and plugging it in. The most critical controls. This is another one of the most popular questions that gets asked. They always try and narrow it down to three. I really have a hard time narrowing it down to three, so I usually narrow it down to four. Number one. Network isolation. Segregate the networks. Make sure they're isolated from one another. There is a standard in ISA 99 
One of the, the network methodologies is called zones and conduits. This means isolating the network systems from one another and only allowing them to communicate if they absolutely need to. So separate the emergency system, separate the vibration control system, separate the compression control system, separate the DCS, and only allow them to communicate if absolutely necessary. The second most important control is without a doubt patch management. Have something in your portfolio for patch management. I'm not saying have the most advanced patch management criteria. All I'm saying is have a policy in place. Have something in place, even if it's walking around and updating the firmware, updating the software, ensuring there's no bugs, Microsoft updates, endpoint protection updates, etc. Have that element of patch strategy in place. A quick story, uh, just a few months ago, actually back in 2017, Microsoft released on one of their Patch Tuesdays a patch for uh, a vulnerability called Eternal Blue. So if you saw in my second slide, I believe, on the top right-hand corner, it said NSA Vault 7 was released into the public. Well, this is true. It's the National Security Agency's Vault Number 7. There's a bunch of small tools that they wrote to hack into your systems and mine, and they're very successful. So that vault was released into the public. Subsequently, some of, them, some of the code was rewritten and eventually exploited a weakness within Microsoft Windows. Microsoft found this as such a massive hole that they pulled Windows XP out of retirement. They do not do that. And they created a patch and sent it out to the world. They did this just over a month before the first infection of WannaCry, if you remember, was reported. So how many people in the room patch their network infrastructures more often than once a month? We got one. So this is where we have to have that element of at least a procedure in place to patch our solutions. The third, endpoint protection. I'm not talking about my grandfather's antivirus. We're talking about layered defense in depth, intrusion prevention, integrity control, data loss prevention, anti-malware, real solutions that provide layered and structured endpoint protection. We even have endpoint protections today that are looking at anomalous traffic and shutting it down. So we're not talking about your typical signature-based algorithm. We're talking here about behaviors. Anybody know the difference between the two, signatures and behaviors? Okay, quick example. Steve, you said yesterday you, you have some kids? You do. How old's your son? Seven. Steve's son is seven years old. So Steve walks into a supermarket with his son. This is an example, by the way, it's hypothetical. And he tells his son, okay, son, we're going to walk into the supermarket, and you will not grab the milk and spill it on the floor. Do you understand me, Steve Jr.? And Steve Jr. looks up at his son and he says, at his dad, and he says, absolutely, sure. So they start walking through the supermarket. Kid sees the juice, takes the cap off, pours it all over the floor. Did Steve Jr. do anything wrong as far as his instructions? No, because the instructions talked about the milk. Steve Jr. targeted the juice. That's exactly what a signature-based algorithm does. It has a very specific subset of code that protects against that particular criteria. And that's it. Behavior-based flips that entire equation on its head. So in the supermarket example, Steve Jr. walking in, and, the, and Steve says to his son, look, we're going to walk into this supermarket, and you're going to do one thing. You're going to walk next to me, and you're going to hold my hand, and that's it. Everything else is off limits. That's what behavior-based algorithms do. That's what integrity control does. It creates a whitelisted criteria of behavior and doesn't allow anything else to take place. A lot more challenging to set up. I'll be the first to admit it. A lot more time consuming. But the end result, we talked about the first line of defense. The end result becomes the last line of defense. So if all of your security controls are penetrated, you still have that whitelisted sandbox where nothing can take place inside of that controlled environment. So that's my third recommendation. And my fourth is AAA, authentication, authorization, and auditing. Some also call it accounting. Having role-based access controls throughout the entire network infrastructure based on the necessity. So we're not giving control systems engineers the ability to do anything and everything that they want. 
having usernames and passwords, multi-factor authentication if you can swing it, and also the ability to log where authentication attempts are coming from, ensuring that everybody has their own security criteria and credentials to enter the network based on a specific policy that we wrote. We also ask, what are the primary concerns when managing multiple ICS vendors? The primary concern, the short answer here, is interoperability. So we get asked many times, one of the largest network solutions that we developed was a couple of years ago in Nigeria. We had 13 different ICS vendors. We had the opportunity to lead the security effort and we had to find a way to integrate all of the security solutions. Well, the reality is, security is a common language. The only question that we have in terms of the challenge is interoperability between the control systems. Security stuff doesn't change. You want a secure infrastructure. It all comes down to interoperability within that network platform. And can those systems live well together? There are many different technologies and solutions that you can customize to ensure that these solutions become segregated from one another. And finally, what is the fundamental target of awareness training? Well, I think the easiest way to answer this is education. That's the fundamental target. When you create an awareness session, what you're hoping your students will get out of it is not the ability to configure an endpoint to protection solution, not the knowledge to differentiate between a unidirectional firewall and a data diode, not the ability to configure an IDS. It's the educational aspect. Having that awareness, having that understanding of the security landscape, what we're up against, and how we should, as humans, behave accordingly. And here's another example of that. We went out on the street, we asked iPhone users if they wanted to try the new iPhone, the iPhone 7. And when we took their current phone, we cleaned it, we put it in a different case, and we handed the phone right back to them. <laughs> Told them it was the new one. Do you think we found anyone who believed that? Well, let's find out with this first look at the iPhone 7. We've gotten some prototypes of the 7, and one of the great thing about the 7 is it's an instant data transfer, so you can transfer a lot of your settings from your current phone to the 7 and try it out instantly as if it was your own phone. Oh, cool. Do you want to take a spin? Absolutely. Okay, great. Would you mind giving Patrick your old phone? Do you need my basket? Okay. It, it will yeah. not do it. <laughs> And you said you've had one since the three? Oh yeah, probably since I'd say 2011 or 2010, whenever that one came out. Now this new one is water resistant, right? Yes. Now have you ever had uh, anything where you've gotten water on any of your iPhones? Yes. I, uh, what, what happened? Dropped it in the toilet. Dropped it in the toilet? <laughs> yeah. And did you do the rice thing? Yes, I did. did and it, it work? didn't work, no. Okay, oh, no. and we have, we have the new iPhone with wow. all the settings. Okay. Wait, so this is like all my stuff on it? This is all your stuff on the new one. Cool. That's and what, great. How does it feel? Thinner. Thinner? A little bit. Uh, does it I, feel uh, lighter as well? Yeah, actually, than, than my 6 Plus, yes. And uh, you could test to see if all your info has transferred. Has it transferred? Yeah, I already got a text message from a friend of mine, so yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> um, let's see. So can you just sort of talk to us about the features of the phone? How does it feel? How does it look? It's a lot smoother. I like it. Feels lighter. Feels lighter. Than the other one. It definitely looks a lot more crisp. Yeah, you know, a lot more clear. Um, it, even the the um, the screen itself, like there's, I don't know, it looks more um, smooth and glossy. I guess right, I would yeah. say. Like it's much clearer. It's much clearer than the yes. old phone. And in this terms one. of in terms of speed, what would you say? Is it faster? Uh, much faster. <laughs> well, the new phone will be about six hundred dollars. Yeah. But today, if you give us like a fifty. We will just let you walk away with that phone. You're joking. Nope. Swear to God, for 50 bucks. That's like a new Apple thing. Okay. You ready? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll do it. I don't have a $50 bill, but I can get one. Do you want to go to a cash machine and sure. come right back? Yeah. Okay. I'll do it. She had it already. So. She had it already? There you go. Okay, great. And here's Sweet. your brand new iPhone 7. <laughs> Yay! Okay. That is great. And now oh. everything is going to be transferred over and everything? Everything is. You can even check it out. It's exactly the same. Brand new phone in your old case. Okay. For 50 bucks. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. Because that's your old phone. Yeah. yeah. Huh? 
Education and awareness, without a doubt, the number one priority. So I've come to the end. I've done a time check. I think I have about seven minutes, so I'll try and make this story quick. Again, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, this is a situation that happened to me and my wife. It happened in London. Uh, this is a map here from where I was and where I ended up, down here in Victoria Station. I hopped on a train in Houston and went up to Milton Keynes. For those that are familiar with the area, I now know that it is not the north. I used to say that, and I got yelled at by everybody in the audience. Of course, when I give this presentation in Thailand, nobody is more aware, so it's perfectly fine. This particular situation happened here in Victoria, so right before I boarded the train. This is a picture of my shining bald head in front of the Tower Bridge, and this is a picture of the receipt that I bought the train ticket. So what you're seeing on screen now is a call log for my wife's iPhone. These two entries that I've got highlighted, J work happened at 3.08 p.m. And this magical number here is also from me. How? I don't know. But if you do know, come see me after. This happened at 3 p.m. So both of these situations were, both of these call entry logs came from me on my Dubai-based mobile phone, calling my wife, first one at 3 p.m., second at 3.08, which means the contents of this story happened within that eight-minute period. So, the train ride surprise. What happened? First of all, when my wife and I talked, by the way, she accompanies me on many different trips. Uh, in this particular one, she wasn't able to join me, so she was making fun of me, kind of throwing some jokes. For those of you that are married, you know whenever your wife or partner throws a joke, you gotta laugh, right? At some point, it gets a little bit more difficult to keep laughing, especially when it's not funny. So she started saying, enjoy the train ride along the English countryside. Another thing that she said was, are you coming home tonight? She asked me, uh, she told me to enjoy a nice hot cup of tea, and she said, I'm sure it's much colder there than it is here. Perfectly normal conversations, taking a couple of jabs, no issues whatsoever. However, after about five minutes, I noticed that she was acting a bit incoherent. She's acting strange. So for example, whenever I would ask her a specific question, she would answer with one of these four statements. So I would say, are you okay? And she'd say, yes. I'd say, you're sure you're okay? She'd say, yeah. And then I'd say, are you tired? She'd say, no. Are you sleeping? And she'd say, no. I said, you're sure everything's perfectly fine? Yes. Great. So what are you doing today? Are you coming home tonight? It's awkward. She already asked me that. No, I'm not coming home tonight. I still got a few more days in the trip. You're sure you're okay? Yes. Nothing I should be concerned about. Nope. Okay. So tell me, what's your brother doing today? Enjoy the train ride along the English countryside. So now I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. As a security guy, I'm thinking maybe she's trying to tell me something. All yes and no questions were perfectly answered. But anything specific she gave me a repeat of one of these four statements. Anybody want to guess what happened next? A lot of people say, you hung up on her. No, I wouldn't dare. She called me. So now I'm looking down at what was then my Blackberry. And I swiped over and I said, hello? And she said, oh, hi, hon, sorry about that. We got disconnected about five minutes ago. I've been trying to call you back ever since, and I've been unable to do so. And I said, wait a second. What do you mean we got disconnected five minutes ago? She said, yeah, what are you talking about? It's perfectly normal. We always get disconnected when you're traveling. I said, no, you don't understand. I'm still speaking to your ghost on the other line. And she says, come on, you're scaring me. She didn't believe me. I couldn't convince her. I said, you know what? Through the power of technology, I'm going to convince you. So I merged the calls together. And now she hears herself in perfect clarity, repeating four sentences over and over and over. And she flips out. She says, okay, I believe you. I'm really scared. Please disconnect and call me back. And that's exactly what I did. So what happened? Again, as a security guy, the first thing that I did was document the situation and share it with my team because I really wanted their opinions. Some people said maybe it was a technical malfunction that caused you to hear recorded sayings. No, <laughs> that's not. Because how does that explain the coherent responses, the yeses and nos? Again, when we're troubleshooting, we're using a process of elimination. And the first thing that we see is the coherent responses negate the technical malfunction. Also, 
why is my conversation being recorded in the first place? Something to consider, right? What about a scrambling device? Absolutely not. Why? Because the technology, at least commercially available, does not exist that would be able to record real time and re inject real time at specific intervals. Maybe automated, maybe isolated, but certainly not real time. At least not something that you and I can pick up from your local Best Buy. What about that 212 area code number? That's Manhattan, New York. I happen to be familiar with that area code because that's where I'm from. So the first thing that I did was call that number. And for those of you familiar with any kind of American telecommunications error, it's always been the same for the past 30 years. It's always a specific tone followed by somebody saying, you know, it's a recorded saying that says you have reached an inoperable number, etc. That's not what happened here. Somebody answered. And he said, hello? And I didn't expect anybody to answer, so I was a bit nervous. And I said, yeah, hi, um, who are you? These lines got crossed. I was trying to call my wife. Your number showed up on the call, and he stopped me. He interrupted me. He said, son, you've got the wrong number. And he hung up on me. Now, since then, I have not been able to reach that number. It's been completely disconnected. These recorded sentences are what we call fillers. They encourage common talk. So imagine if you were a bad person and there is some agency that is attempting to listen in on what you're doing. Their number one priority is to stop you from what you're doing, correct? With that being said, they want the same thing that we want, operational efficiency. They don't want to waste time, they don't want to waste money, and they certainly don't want to waste human casualties. So therefore, these situations, are, these conversations are isolated from one another to bore someone and expedite the conversation. It's very similar to advanced malware that we see out there in the field. It's called stealth listening. So the first question that I had was, who's behind this? Who has the capability? And of course, we've got all the usual players, all of our friends, right? But these are the devil that you know. I don't have a problem with these. What I'm concerned about is the devil that you don't. Perhaps it's something a little bit more malicious. So the moral of the story is, first and foremost, it gives us an appreciation for privacy and confidentiality. Because the reality is there's nothing that any one of us could have collectively done to protect against these situations that happen to me on a regular basis. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm targeted, my last name's Abdallah. I'm originally Palestinian, born in the United States. I happen to be an FAA private pilot. And I'm traveling on a Dubai Middle Eastern phone in a crowded London train station calling another phone in the Middle East. So I'm sure the yellow flags are rising. And they've been my good friends ever since. By the way, now I actually have fun with it. So every time this happens, I actually try and carry on a conversation with whomever is listening on the other side. And I'm just praying that one day somebody with a sense of humor is going to respond to me, but they never do. It also tells us the importance of security awareness. So knowing, again, this goes back to the educational factor, knowing what's around us and trying our best to prepare ourselves for it. Of course, it gives us the idea that Big Brother is always listening, but trust me, it is unsettling the first time it happens to you. And the best response that I got was from one of our engineers in Germany. And he came back and said, no, Jay, it's not the first time, it's just the first time you noticed. My name is Jay Abdallah. Thank you very much for your time.